Welcome to Breast Friends Cancer Support Network. My name is Michelle Beck. I'm a two-time nine-year survivor of breast cancer. I'm the patient programs assistant at Breast Friends of Oregon. And when I have time, I write at a blog called I Never Liked Pink. So today I'm so, so excited. I've got a country superstar here on the show and her name is Kelly Lang. I finished her book a few weeks ago. It's called I'm Not Going Anywhere. And there's a song by that same name. It's been on global commercials and, but we're going to get into all of that. So Kelly is a woman of many talents. She's a, as I mentioned, she's a celebrated country music star and songwriter, wife of country legend, TG Shepard, mother to two amazing women and author, comedian with an alter ego XOXO, which we're definitely going to get into later oh. <laughs> and a breast cancer survivor. And it, so glad to have Kelly on here for many reasons, but it really shows that cancer knows no bounds. It affects everyone. And, but it's also a story of inspiration because she has come through it and is glowing. So, but we're going to talk about all that. And I, uh, since I, I read the book, we, we, you know, I'm, I have to mention her love of her backyard pool and she has a beautiful tan compared to me who's pale and white here in Oregon. Um, she's got celebrity besties and so much more. So Kelly, Thank you for being here today. I'm so honored to have you. Well, I'm equally honored to be on your show. I, I always love to talk about things that I've been through and hopes to be an inspiration to someone else that might be needing the, the advice or I wish I had had someone like myself to have gone through my journey with. So maybe this will be an open vessel for someone listening. I love that. And that's, that's really what it's all about because there are so many of us who go through these journeys and we have the heart to give back in whatever way it is for you. It was writing a book and using your song also in to really provide hope and inspiration for others. For me, I love talking on the show. So I get to talk to amazing women like you. So thank you for being here today. So I gave you a little bit of a bio, but tell us a little bit about your life, where, where you're at right now. And, um, I know you're in, in uh, Tennessee, but in, you know, the, the, the bio, not the geography, sorry. Well, I was born in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, the youngest of four children. And um, my dad worked for Conway Twitty. I'm, I don't know if you've heard of him before. I have, but, yes. Um, he's a country music superstar. Legend. Mm -hmm. legend, yes, indeed. And, and growing up in Oklahoma, dad started working with him um, as a road manager. And Conway wanted him to, to go on the road with him and handle all things uh, that go on the road. And it's a lot. It's a big job. So he eventually wanted to move his whole organization from Oklahoma to Hendersonville, Tennessee. When I was about six or seven, I think I was seven, about 30 or 40 of us journeyed across <laughs> Interstate 40 over to Hendersonville. And it was like Plymouth Rock. We just landed there and, and we <laughs> stayed. And um, I've been here ever since. And, and it's a sweet little community. Most every country artist lives here. If they don't now, they have in the past. And it's a little small, it's like a lake community. And you go to Publix and you run into Marty Stewart or, you know, at one point, Johnny Cash. And, and it's, it's just people don't pester um, the celebrities. They just, they just, how are you doing? They move on with their day. It, it's a darling place to live. And um, so when I uh, went through elementary school, junior high, high school, it was all in Hendersonville. And I began my singing career when I was, well, I wrote my first song when I was six and then started singing on the Ralph Emery morning show here in Nashville. It's a very popular regional show. It was, mm -hmm. it was out of Nashville, but it was, it went to several different states. And I really, that was like a, a college education for me. So I, I started that and then I went on to do Star Search in Nashville now. And I was the go-to opening act for many country music artists. And that's how I originally met my future husband, whom I'm married to now. Well, you don't mention a couple of things about you started on the morning show at age 12, correct? Yes, I did. Yes. And your first single lady lady was at age 15. Yes, it's, it was. And you, you were a prodigy and obviously it comes from you, ha you have this beautiful voice, but really you were surrounded by, by 100%, um, listeners in the book, I'm not going anywhere. Kelly, she writes about all of this, but there's amazing QR codes in there that you can scan and watch little, a few minute videos. And she talks about being a young child sitting in Conway Twitty's recording studio, just watching the magic happen. And you, you literally were, you were born to do this and, you know, lucky you have the voice because <laughs> it, it made, it made the magic happen. 
so well, the funny gonna... thing is at the at the beginning I didn't have you know as trained of a voice I guess as you'd say I had more gumption and enthusiasm <laughs> than I had talent for sure but I just I I'm like you I just always knew that that was the direction I was meant to be in and luckily you know there was really nobody in my family that had any musical desires and it was just strange that I would end up with all this passion for this and I believe you know, in the music industry in particular, the passion is more important than the talent generally, because it's, it's a hard business and you have to have to very tough skin and the mm -hmm. desire to keep going, even though, and I had tenacity as a kid. So my, my son is musical. He's 11 and he plays keyboards. He plays guitar. He's very wow. into music and no one else in my family has any musical skills whatsoever. And we just took him to his first concert a few weeks ago, Imagine Dragons. And it literally, it filled my soul so much. It was one of my proudest moments because I know he's going to do something musical, whether it's a hobby or who knows what, but just seeing that passion in him, I, it, I love it. And we're doing everything we can to foster that. So oh, it's I love that. That's one thing I really loved about my parents is, is all four of us kids were very diverse in our likes and what we wanted to do, but they just wanted us to be the best and be happy at whatever, you know, life path we chose. And a lot of parents tend to try to, you know, you're not going to do music. You're going to do, you know, this or that. I'm so grateful that my parents gave us the freedom to, to really choose what was proper, you know, right for all of us kids. So it was, it was a really good gift for, from a parent to a kid. That is super important. I, yes, we, I've had many talks with my girlfriends and I about letting go of our hopes and dreams for our kids and fostering their own dreams. And I'm sure you've <laughs> done that as well with your own daughters. But well, my daughters are both very unique and they're very different in their own and what they like and they're nothing alike. It's, it's so weird. It's like somebody split me in the middle. One of them's like me and, the other, and when I was a kid, one of them's like me more as an adult. And they're, they're very unique and I celebrate their, their uniqueness. And, and that I don't, can't think of another word because um, they're both, just very talented and, and freakishly energetic on their own. And it's just, they're very bright girls and I'm very, very proud to be their mama. Well, I can see they get that from you because you are a bundle of energy and amazing in your own right. So most of my listeners are cancer survivors. So let's dig into that a little bit. Can you tell us about your, your diagnosis and how you found it? Just, you know, the details. So I was single. I had two little girls. They were uh, nine and 13 at the time. I was just dating my future husband. We'd been dating for a few years and um, I was sitting home in my condo watching the Oprah Winfrey show. And God there was this Oprah. girl, I know I miss her terribly. Um, there was this girl, she was probably 26 on there. She was asking people to be mindful of breast cancer under 40 because she was diagnosed in her twenties. And I was like, well, that's depressing. So I kept flipping the channel. I didn't want to see that. And nothing else was really catching my attention. So I went back to it and she was telling people to please, you know, consider doing a self-exam. So I'm like, I've never done one before. I was 36. Young. So I, you know, kind of felt around it's weird and, oh, there was a couple of knots under my left arm. They felt like BBs. One of them was smaller than the other, but they were both very rigid and very, um, obviously not the same on the other side. So I, I kind of just mentally put it behind me. I went to my regular OBGYN visit a few months later and she had delivered both of the girls and she said, yeah, I, I feel what you're, you're talking about. She did a little ultrasound. She said, yeah, I see something there, but you're too young. And I said, mm, that's not what the girl on Oprah said, you know, and she says, we'll keep an eye on it. And I'm like, okay. So about eight months later, I was singing in Switzerland and I was grabbing my bag off the tarmac and I felt this really strong, it was like a jolt of pain under my arm. And I, it made me happy though, because I heard cancer doesn't hurt. Can cancer doesn't hurt, right? Mm hmm Lies. Yeah. So, um, but it caught my attention though. I was really grateful that it caught my attention. So that led me to be more, uh, you know, direct with my doctor. I said, look, this is still here. I feel pain there. I want a diagnostic mammogram. And she was like, this did not show up on my mammogram. This did not even show up on my ultrasound. I, I took the wand from the lady doing the ultrasound. I said, I'm really um, anxious about this. And I'm asking you to please let me hold the wand. Let me show you where I'm feeling this. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was really bold and assertive of me. I wasn't really like that. That was, I think that was just really God going, this is, mm-hmm. you know, you know, gave me courage to do that. So um, she was a little upset about it, but it's my life. So saved your life. Yeah, it did. And so she called the radiologist in and he was like, uh, we need to get you to your doctor ASAP. So within the next day, um, they did a biopsy and lo and behold, it was cancer. And it not only was cancer, but it had spread to lymph nodes. And well, your listeners know the whole story of that. Once it spreads, you're down the whole chemo journey. And it was, it was, I was really angry that I didn't listen to my gut earlier and my doctor didn't take it more serious. But you finally did. And as you say, being your own advocate and being a strong vocal woman really did save your life because they would have been yep. like, oh, you're still too young. And more and more women are being di- diagnosed young and with more aggressive cancers. So yes. 17 years have gone by and you are living this, you know, your best life. And because you spoke up, which is so, so important. So did you have any family history of breast cancer or been around it at all? Well, my, I have several aunts that have had it, but nobody in my core, you know, mm-hmm. family, like my mom or my sisters, no, but my aunts did have it. And, you know, that was the thing. They were older and, and I didn't feel a strong connection as far as uh, I couldn't speak with them really about what it felt like, because I, I just felt like I was in a different category being so much younger. Mm-hmm. I did speak with them about it, of course, being my family, but it just, I didn't relate, you know, and, um, I tried to, to, to really understand why, why at such a young age, what, what, would, what did I do wrong? I felt like I did something wrong. You don't, you, you know, you, it's not anything that you did wrong. It, and, and it may or may not have been his, uh, you know, form of genetics. I don't know. I never did the BRCA gene testing. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't ever really sure. I just wanted to get it behind me, (laughs) get it behind you and move on. But that's also really hard to do when you're, yes, you had TG in your life, but a single mom to two young girls. How, how did you talk to them about it and just advice for others out there who might have, you know, small children? What, what do you say? Well, that's a really great question. Um, you know, when you're going through this, you're just trying to keep alive. You're just trying to just stay alive. But when you're a mother going through this, you have to be strong, even though you have to be strong for them. So they won't be afraid. So I found myself putting on a weirdly brave hat to make everybody else around me feel comfortable with this. Yes, mommy's bald and she looks like a freak, but look, we're going to make fun of it. And we're going to tease about it. And we're, you know, so I kept laughing a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I did bring pamphlets home from the hospital, how to speak with your children. And it backfired on me because my, my teenager, she would die if she knew I was telling you this, but she's nothing like this now. So I understand this, but when she's 13, mm-hmm. um, I said, I, I want to talk with you about this. I want to make sure it's the tension's not all on me. You're going through this too. You know, how, how are you feeling about this? And I, I interrupted her game that she was playing. Apparently it very upsetting to her. She says, Oh mom, quit milking it. <laughs> so I was like, okay. You know, I, I didn't think I was milking it. Here I was, you know, bald and green. I thought that was worth a conversation, but, um, in the, out of the mouths of babes, you know, it's teens kind of are a whole teens are a whole special breed of humans. I have four Ooh. step kids and they're now age 17 to 23. So I I've lived all that and I'm going to go through it again with my own son. So bl- bless them. Um, <laughs> And you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did have TG in your life at this time, but he was your boyfriend and it, there was a lot of emotions that came up through this. I, I know he did, but tell us how he, I know there was one episode in the book that you really write about in particular, how he stepped up to support you. Well, we had been dating for maybe three years at the time I, I was diagnosed and <clears throat> If you don't know who T.G. Shepard is, he's a country singer. He's had 21 number one hits. He was kind of like a Tim McGraw in the day Mm -hmm. in the the 80s and 90s, kind of a, you know, his songs had a big, big sexual, you know, appeal to them. Ladies, men kind of appeal, I guess. He's nothing like that in real life, which is funny. But um, when we first started dating, he had come out of a really tough divorce 
course, I was raising two children. He wasn't interested in getting married right away. He really wasn't. It was just at his, we're, we have a little bit of age difference. So he was not sure he wanted to raise kids. You know, that was kind of a, mm-hmm. a big step for him, especially that little of children, but he couldn't stay away from us. It was funny. It was like, it was like, well, you don't want to commit bye-bye, you know, but you, you guys were magnets. You just could not be without each other. It was, yes, it was just, we couldn't stay away from each other. So I'm diagnosed and he's a big caregiver. He loves to make sure people around him are safe. And he just enveloped me in his arms. And one of the most special stories that I have to tell you, um, I had written a song, I'm not going anywhere several months before my diagnosis with cancer. And when I, when I wrote it, I wrote it about a man that was passing away and I kept seeing his wife coddling him and she says, honey, I'm not going anywhere. And then I saw him soften Mm -hmm. and I thought, boy, if you could bottle that, that would be amazing. You know, just knowing that somebody's not alone. And so I I wrote the song and one day um, I was in my condo, TG and I never lived together. I had dropped the kids off at school and I came back and it's the first time I really let myself cry. I was Mm -hmm. just devastated. I had marks all over me, bald and green, and my eyebrows were gone. My eyelashes were gone. And I just looked in my eyes and I started wailing. And he had let himself in my condo unbeknownst to me. He had a key and heard me crying. So he ran upstairs and he never saw me without my wig or something on, you know, so Mm -hmm. it was probably really shocking to him too. And he grabbed me put a white terry cloth robe around me and pulled me to the ground and started rocking me like a baby. And he was kissing my bald head. And I said, TG, don't look at me. I look like a monster. I said, you know what? We haven't been able to commit at this point. It's time for you to go. I may not live through this. I really need you to go. And he says, I'm not going anywhere. It was like a full circle moment for me. Just got chills. He said, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever known. You're everything to me. I'm, I'm not leaving you. And I'm like, okay. You know, and I write in the book, there's no marriage contract that would have been more binding than that, that particular conversation. And from that point on, you know, he went to every doctor's appointment with me. He sat in my MRIs with me and sang to me and held my hand because he knew how scared I was. And, you know, you just, you, you can't, that's, that's love story you write about you know, and and I couldn't believe I was actually living that in the darkest point of my life. I was also experiencing the highest of my, my love, you know, so it was, it was a really, it was a beautiful time for me. Thank you for sharing that. We do have so much more to talk about, but we're going to take a quick break. So listeners, please stay with us. If you'd like more information on breast friends, please go to our website, breastfriends.org and go to patient programs to see what breast friends can do for you. Stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Michelle Beck and my guest is country superstar artist, songwriter, so many things, Kelly Lang. And we've been talking about her prophetic song, I'm Not Going Anywhere, and also the book she's written of the same name. Kelly, before break, you just shared with us this amazing story of your now husband, T.G. Shepard, who was there for you and really helped you turn a corner in terms of your emotion and the the love you had felt and you obviously eventually did get married but i think four years later on the with the engagement the engagement couch that you know we talk about in the book and well, he was he was a slow starter you know it was a long seven years but you know um one thing i'm really proud of him he he was on the highest of mountains in his music career and tax laws change life changes ca- careers slow down things you know evolve and um for him to take on not only myself, but two small children, he wanted to be financially very capable of taking mm-hmm. really good care of us. And he went through a really rough patch financially. And we just both started from scratch. I started from bald and green raising kids, but I had great credit. <laughs> <laughs> and he was making the money, but you know, his credit was a little wobbly because of some of those issues. So we just decided as a team, that when I turned 40, uh, I had I had the most darling birthday party. It was staying alive birthday party. And I was I just like that. John. <laughs> but at my 40th birthday party, we decided to um, bond this together permanently. We were married in August, August of 2007. And so um, it, it was just, 
it just had to happen. It was meant to be. And the thing I really love about it is before we got married, we experienced richer or poor sickness mm-hmm. and in health. You know, we, we went through a lot of the things that would generally break a lot of marriages up. We already lived through them and, and lived to tell the story. So it's a great connection. And it, it really is so special. And now that you've been through the, the richer, poorer sickness and in health, like you guys have got it, you, you know, you're, you're going to make it, you know, to the eons and listeners, you've got to read the book because we don't have time to talk about all of her celebrity best friends, like Dame Olivia Newton-John and Sir Barry Gibb. And there literally are pictures with Kelly in the book with, with John Travolta and Garth and, and it, it blew my mind as I'm reading through this. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I get, I, I get to talk to this amazing celebrity, but who is so down to earth enough to share everything she has gone through. And I think that's so important to our listeners because they don't feel like this happens to other people. You know, when, when you get diagnosed with cancer, it's, it's all in your head and this and that, but there are women like you who have a, a sense of celebrity in their life and a, a, you know, a legend of a country musician as a husband and, you know, all these celebrities on your phone, but you're still a, a real woman who's gone through this and experienced it and come out on the other side. And your, your attitude has nothing to do with your celebrity, but it's literally the personality that you have and sharing that I think is so important. Thank you very much. I, you know, one of the things about being raised in the country music business is I have been afforded the the ability to know these celebrities behind the curtains. Mm -hmm. They're all real people. They're all broken. They're all hurt. They're all, you know, damaged goods as we all are as human beings. And um, one of the beautiful things I I love about Dame Olivia Newton-John, she wrote the foreword for my book, as a matter of fact, Um, you know, she's experiencing her own health issues yet again. Mm -hmm. This is the third time she has been uh, going through a bout of cancer. Been following that. I learned from her. I learned from watching her and seeing how she handles her fans, her her celebrity life, her child, her cancer diagnosis with such elegance and grace. Grace. And Mm -hmm. if I can be anything like her and be of any kind of light to carry on in her in her name, that's a great uh, gift that I would be able to give people. Well, I think you've definitely done that. So I want to talk more about your song. So you wrote it, witnessing the the passing of. Um, the loved one in a, in a couple and TG said those words to you that he's not going anywhere, but what happened with your song? Because it, it definitely, it blew up and it kind of gave you a whole reinvigoration of that part of your career. Yes. And in, in January of 2020, which everybody knows what 2020 was about right before it was like on my birthday, I got an email from uh, my music administrator and they said that Ascension hospitals would like to use my song, I'm not going anywhere in a local commercial, would I be willing to allow that? And I'm like, sure, you know, so we negotiated the contract and all went well. Well, it exploded. It, it, I got so many emails and voicemails from celebrity artists going, just found out this was you. Naomi Judd was one of them. She was like, I just heard this and I found out it was you. And I didn't tell anybody, you know, my name's tiny, tiny, tiny on the bottom of the commercial. You'd never know it. But the funny thing is I started getting a Shazammed where people oh, can hold yes. up their phone and go, who is singing this? It blew up so much that it, I got on the Shazam charts, which I didn't even know existed, which was, it was so funny. So then the commercial was so successful. They decided to take it more national. They're in 22 regions. So it's, it's scattered across the country. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, with social media, it's all over the world now. So it, I get beautiful letters from people all the time saying, you know, during the pandemic, my song helped their family members get through leaving their loved ones in nursing homes or having passed or even through weddings, people use my song in weddings now. So it's just been such a surprise to me. 16 years after I wrote it, it it all came down to that. Well, and in the video of your song, you, you share personal images. There's Mm -hmm. wedding, wedding photos in there. There's, um, I believe your daughters are also in there Yes, and just of your life. And it, it is so poignant. If you listen to those words and it was talking about, you know, I can't, I can't paraphrase and I can't sing, but like, I will be your breath and I will be here. And it, it's just, I, it literally brought tears to my eyes. I, the first, the first time I re-listened to it, because I've obviously heard it before, but I didn't associate it. And then, um, 
when I found out I was going to have you as my guest, I went through and I'm like, oh my gosh, I totally know that song. And it literally, it, it does it play there in Oregon, the commercial? It, it had not, but I've heard it. I, cause I went through, I'm like, I know that song. We don't have Ascension hospitals here, but okay. I, I had found it. I'd heard it in some other way. So it definitely, it makes its way around. And I think that's so, it's such a special part of your message that you were able to write the song and perform it in such a way <clears throat> that has li- literally given comfort and hope to so many people. And it's so weird because it, it can be used in so many different ways and, and it has been likened to, and I'm very flattered by this connection. Um, you remember Debbie Boone's song, You Light Up My Life? Oh, of course. Yes. It's, mm-hmm. it's being compared to that because that song in, in itself was used in many different uh, people's lives in different directions too. So, um, wow, what a, what a thrill. You know, I thought this song was in a Burt Reynolds movie years ago and it was um, recorded by TG and Crystal Gale as a duet many years ago. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, as a songwriter, anybody creative out there listening, anything you create is not in vain. It, it may take years to evolve, but let me be the uh, guinea pig on that because I did not see this coming. I, you know, only God saw that coming. And, and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to go and, and witness. It, timing is everything. Timing yes. is everything. So don't get discouraged as a creative person. Just keep creating because it's there for a reason. Somebody's going to need that gift at some point in their life. And it might not be on your time. Well, and I saw in the book, I believe it was, or one of your videos, I'm not sure, but you actually, after all this went on, you got to sing at a Tennessee Titans game, the national anthem. <laughs> I did. Um, that was, I didn't see that coming either. Ascension Hospitals is actually the um, official hospital for the Tennessee Titans football team. Mm-hmm. And I got a phone call during Breast Cancer Awareness Month of 2020. Um, of course, the beautiful thing for me is that I, it wasn't live because they had so many different rules with uh, coronavirus sure. that they allowed me to record it ahead of time and it played there. So that was, I took less nerves to do that knowing it was going to be recorded, but uh, what a thrill, what a thrill. I, I can't believe that I was able to do that. It was, it was the highlight of my, my life. Well, it's funny, a small connection here. The quarterback, who I, I think he's since transferred, but it was Marcus Mariota, I think at the time he came from Oregon and he was Oregon Ducks. So my husband and I were fans. So we do it. We were occasionally watching the Titans play. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's, a, I used to have season tickets. I, I don't have them anymore, but um, I love football. It was, it was a blast to be able to, and I have this Jersey, my favorite number is 11, 11. Mm-hmm. And so I have now a t- Tennessee Titan football Jersey with 11 on the front and 11 on the back and my name on the back of it. So it was really fun. Perfect. That is a great time. We're going to take another break. So listeners, please stay with us. If you would like to be a guest on my show or submit your warrior story, please email me at Michelle Beck at breastfriends.org. Stay with us. We'll be back. Welcome back to the show. I'm Michelle and my guest is Kelly Lang, country phenom and comedian and author and oil painter and so much more. So we are going to talk about some of those things now. So one of the things I first loved about you before I really know your whole story was that you have developed a alter ego called XOXO, which is this, this diva in animal print who has this amazing gold belt buckle and who basically has no cares in the world to give and just does her own thing. Where did that come from? Gosh, I, I keep trying to kill her off. But keep her back up. So, Once you start something like that, it's never going to go away. No, I, I'm finding that out. Um, I was writing a, an album with Lori Morgan. She's another country singer. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're there with her music, but I am um, big big artist. And, uh, she asked me to help co-write her album with her. It's kind of the story of her life. And, um, we were together every week for about a year. And this, this thing we do in Nashville is called CMA Fest. It used to be called mm-hmm. Fanfare, where hundreds of thousands of people come and they celebrate country music and they get to meet their favorite artists. And it's turned into a bit more corporate now, but you were able to really one-on-one with the people that you love. So, um, a lot of the fans, Lori was talking to me about, um, they, they know you, but they think they know you better than, than they do. And they sometimes get your stories wrong or your songs wrong or call you by the wrong name, or it's really funny. And they're very passionate 
and a lot of them want to be singers, you know, and um, so she was telling me how that that affects her. And I came dressed up as one of these crazy fans, you know, to the next writing appointment. I put on everything I could have ever possibly found in my closet that was mismatched and leopard and zebra and cheetah and all this stuff and the dark black wig on and a, a mole and a little red cowboy hat. It, and it just started. We started coming up with her name and where she's from. And, and, and she ended up being on the Huckabee national television show. And mm -hmm. I say she, because I am completely separate from this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I love it. Her name, Dewana Dewa Sue. Dewana Sue from Dewana Sue. North Tennessee. Yeah. <laughs> but she changed it to XOXO just, you know, to be more mm -hmm. forgivable or for understandable, but um, it's just a funny character and it, it, the comedy laughter is healing, you know, and it came at a time when I was getting through all my treatments and we would write and I would, we would act silly. And, and I just, I love to laugh. And if that was to bring anybody healing, which I, strangely enough, I've had just as many people write to me and say, oh, I've been laughing for hours and I was having such a bad day when I saw XO, I've kept laughing that's just as important as writing a, a book that is, you know, very serious and strong words and all like, like I'm not going anywhere. So two sides of our, our brains can be equally as healing. I totally understand that when, since I've, I've gone through treatment twice, the, the second time around my husband and I, when I'm getting ready to go in for my mastectomy, we're in the hospital, just cracking up. And I swear the nurses thought we were out of our minds because that is not how you're normally in there. And to me at that point, it was either I'm going to laugh or I'm going to cry. And so we chose laughter and <laughs> because it's, I, I, you've been there. So it's, you know, and most of our listeners get it. Like if, because if you're not, you have to, there's so much emotion going on in, in your heart. And, and when you were going through cancer treatment that you have to find something. And I love that EXO has really helped you as well. Just find ways to laugh at life because it is so important. She's so, um, it's really weird though. I have to tell you, I, I would give anything to be able to say what EXO gets by with. <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm more like EXO than I am Kelly, unfortunately. So in, in my head, you can hear a little EXO things, little tidbits that she would say. I normally am thinking them, but I can't say them out loud. <laughs> but um, no, I understand that the finding things to laugh out during, you know, serious situations, it just helps to, to glaze over really dark times. And, and I encourage other people, even if it's just to turn on a, an I Love Lucy show or, you know, just something, just find something light and and not as heavy and don't focus on the darkness focus on something a little brighter while going through your treatments it will help you i promise and one thing that you had mentioned in the book and in one of your videos many people consider cancer a death sentence and you made the choice to have it be a life sentence tell us about that yeah i um i the day i was diagnosed was just dark it was so dark and heavy you don't think you'll ever hear those words and you know your listeners obviously are I've heard these words and I was I was looking out this window and the and the uh, the Venetian blinds the sun would come in and just blind me at five and something in the morning and I would just say oh I hate that you know well the next day after I was diagnosed I was like thank you God I get to see that light again thank you for the trees oh my gosh the water is beautiful you know I just had an instant appreciation for things I took for granted mm -hmm. and I loved deeper. I, I had more passion for things because you know what, if you think you're not going to get to do them very long, you do them more and you do them bigger and you do them with more gratitude and appreciation. And that was, um, it was a byproduct of, of, I, I, I wouldn't want your, anybody that's listening to have to be put in a situation to say you have cancer in order for them to live like that. You don't have to have a diagnosis to have a life sentence, to look at life with gratitude. Choose it now. Use your great candles. Burn your good candles. Use your great seat sheets and your fine china today. Don't right. wait for the darkness to come. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And you don't know what today is going to bring. Exactly. And, but that is so true. I've one of my guests a few months ago, she wrote a book called when women rise, which talks about all the stresses that are really put on women who are trying to be moms and have careers and take care of everything and support everyone. And she talks a lot about meditation and mantras. And one of the mantras in there that I have adopted is I'm grateful for this breath. 
this life and this body. And I, I say that every day and yes, my body had cancer. Cancer did not have me. And I love that. Yeah. I mean, I don't like when people say I, my cancer, Mm -hmm. my, my, you know, this or that don't put a title on it. Don't own it because it will start owning you if you Mm -hmm. continue to give it that power. But that's fantastic, Michelle. I love that. So it's, it's finding those little things. And I, did your writing your book also help you kind of, even though it was obviously years after your diagnosis and you wrote about literally your entire life story, was that cathartic for you to be able to express all of that? It is. I'm the type of person that once I go through something really heavy and dark, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, I just, I didn't want people to define me by that. I didn't want people to feel sorry for me or always be the cancer girl. You know, I I hated that. I didn't like, I didn't want to wear pink. I didn't want to wear anything, you know, to remind me or bring that tension to me in any way. But the doctors tell me it was very serious. And I said, how serious are we talking lifetime movie? Do I need to do a video for my kids or, you know, she goes, yes. And I'm like, oh, wow. You know, I didn't realize because how young I was, they would take it more serious and it has a possibility of coming back, you know, more than normal. Mm -hmm. So I did take the time to write down a lot of notes and just in case my kids would want to know what had happened, you know? And then I never looked at them again. I I didn't even know that I even had them. And during the pandemic, I cleaned out my garage and found all these notes. And I was like taken back because I'd forgotten. Maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe it's a healing opportunity for me not to deal in it, but I read through them and it would hit me really hard. You know, I was like, whoa, this is heavy stuff. So my friend Kim um, from Kentucky, she called me that day and she said, what are you doing? I said, cleaning out my garage. And she said, I told her what I found and she said, I had a dream last night that you had written a book and it helped a lot of people. Maybe those notes, you should start there and go backwards and go frontwards. And that's exactly what I did. And yes, it was cathartic. I didn't want to feel it again, but it was healthy for me to feel it again. Being this far out, Mm -hmm. it wasn't as threatening, you know, so it was, it was good. I, I just hit my five-year mark of my second time around and I can process things a lot easier now. And I can, mm-hmm. I can talk about all of it. And I, I will say that I was in, um, visiting someone in a hospital yesterday, the same hospital where I had my, my mastectomy and my full hysterectomy. And it brought up a lot of anxiety for me. Um, it does. So yeah, going I into a- you're clear of the chemo rooms. I steer clear of the, you know, um, this last January, I went and did a speech for, um, <clears throat> the Inside Out Foundation in Lubbock, Texas, beautiful foundation. They provide wigs and prosthetics and offer mm-hmm. women. And um, I went into their prosthetic room and I, I couldn't breathe, you know, because I was like, oh, I just build this again. But it was important that I did. It was important that I was able to um, to do that. And uh, I was able to scathe <laughs> without needing their help. Thank God this time. But um, it, it did. It, it's things that you don't, it's PTSD probably it that brings up mm-hmm. those moments, but um, they're few and far between. Yeah. And I think the farther out we get, <laughs> but being able to, to write your book. And I, I imagine part of your target audience for the book is women are, who've, or, you know, who've been impacted by breast cancer. What is, what is your hope for the book? And, and even the song going forward, where do you, where do you want those to go? Well, it's already done more than what I thought it would do. It's already gotten into hands that that I've never met before, like yourself, you know, Mm -hmm. and what a beautiful thing for you and I to be able to connect over my book. I never knew you before this. So I'm things like this really matter. Mm -hmm. Um, Yesterday, I got a lovely uh, or day before I got a lovely long text from um, a relative of a friend of mine saying that um, she didn't she felt very alone during her situation with cancer and that my book comforted her. That it, and some people that in my life that I thought would be grateful or happy to to read it, it wasn't for them. They didn't even acknowledge that I had written it. But people that I had never met before are being blessed by it. And and it, it's if that if it could just bless one person, it was worth my time. Um, so it's done more than what I thought it would do. If it continues, that's even it's like icing on my cake. You know, I'm just grateful to have tied a bow on it and set it aside and look forward to do new things. 
Well, I definitely, I have the, the soft copy of it, but I'm going to buy the hard copy because I'm old and I like actually reading regular <laughs> books. So I, I, like I, hard I, <laughs> I know I, I, I have regular books. I have a landline. It's, it is what it is, <laughs> but where do you want to go next in your career? Well, I, I mentioned uh, speaking in the Lubbock, Texas area. I love that so much. I've done a few speeches. Um, when I say speeches, it's not really speeching. I just love people so much. I love to talk. I love to communicate and um, share my story. And anybody out there that would like me to come and do that, that's a real passion of mine right now mm -hmm. to be able to, to help in any way. Music is just a conduit, painting or acting or whatever is just a, a conduit to the heart. And um, I want to connect with more people's hearts this year. That is super important. And we'll definitely uh, get the word out about that as much as we can. I want to talk a little bit about not, not her celebrity, but your friendship that you've made with Dame Olivia Newton-John because of the breast cancer. Now, growing up, we were very fans of Grace. Like you, you see Grace, we fall in love with Sandy, the, the good girl and the bad girl. And we want to be both of those women at, at, at various times in our lives. But you were actually able to meet her through other friends and developed a relationship, not as a fan, but as a friend, because you have that connection of breast cancer. What was that like for you? It's still surreal. <laughs> Mind blowing. <laughs> it, it really is. Um, if she weren't so lovely and kind and funny, I, I would still be probably very nervous in her presence, but she's just so over the top lovely. You know, um, I met her when I was six years old. Of course, she wouldn't have had any remembrance of that. Um, I've always been a fan, super fan. I even cut my hair and wore headbands at one point. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Let, let's get physical is going through my brain right now. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, I was, I met Barry Gibb at, in Hendersonville, we did a, a fundraiser thing together and have remained really good friends with his family. And um, he was putting on a diabetes fund foundation benefit. And he asked my husband and I to come down there and, and just join them and their family. So he didn't tell me anything else. So we're sitting at this table and I get a tap on the shoulder. Excuse me, may I sit with you? And I look up. <laughs> I mean, how <laughs> do you not song. fall off of your chair? I, I wanted to be, you know, watch, be a little bit dignified, but I, I probably blew it. She, you know, she's just so warm and friendly and she sat next to me and I, and she sang with Barry that night. He forgot to tell me that, you know, so they sang and, and it was great. I never thought I'd see her again. The very next day comes around and I'm at Barry and Linda's house. And for lunch, she had a few people over. Olivia was one of those people. And, um, we just connected. We, it was, a. Linda Gibb had said, you know, Kelly is also a breast cancer survivor. And she asked me, this is funny. She asked me, she said, um, did you go through cancer treatments? And I said, yes, I went through chemo and radiation, but I, I dropped out of chemo early. And she goes, chemo dropout, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. She's just a sweetheart. And, um, you know, she, she's very much like myself. She uses music because um, she loves music, but she uses it as a, a tool to be able to touch hearts as well. And she's gone so far with helping people with her cancer research foundation and her mm -hmm. hospital in Australia. And um, I don't know that I'll ever be able to, to even touch her shoes, rather less be able to put them on. But um, she's, she's such an encourager. And, and uh, when, I'm, when I'm having downtimes with even personal issues, she seems to be, always be there to, to lend a, a nice word of support or doesn't even have to do with cancer sometimes, it's just raising kids or you know music stuff. She's just adorable. And I have found that <clears throat> while having a, a diagnosis can bring you together, it, it also, it doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. I have met my breast friend through my diagnosis she is my silver lining and it's not about the cancer. Like it, it can bring you together, but then you find these other amazing connections. And yeah. well, my, my very, very dear friend, Kim, whom I spoke with you about, mm -hmm. uh, she helped me with, you know, deciding to write my book. She's also a breast cancer survivor. And I felt that because I was more in tune to people going through health issues, I think it makes me, I, I pray for people when I walk through hospital rooms or, or, you know, I don't know when I see people maybe have that have lost their hair or look like they're not feeling well. I, I say a silent prayer as I walk past them and I was automatically attracted to 
to my friend Kim. I did not know who she was or what she was even going through, but I felt this press to go to talk with her. And luckily we've been really good for each other. I didn't know she had already, already gone through breast cancer and she might've needed, you know, some, maybe some words I had to say and not, but she's been more beneficial to me than I have been to her. I can, I can promise you that. But I, I think that I wouldn't have even had an open mind or heart to have gone to speak with her if I had not gone through this myself. And as, as you mentioned, the walking by and saying the silent prayers, faith has been a big part of your journey as well. Oh my goodness. I, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but I cannot imagine going through something so damaging and so hard without the presence of God and the, the peace that Jesus and the Holy Spirit gives me. I, I, it is just instant and I, I can, my prayers are answered instantly. Um, it might be the answer to no, or it's not your time yet or whatever, but I still feel his presence. And I was, you know, a lot of people feel that they're alone. I never felt alone. I never felt that I was going through this by myself. Even if a single person wasn't around me, I felt protected by him. And that's so important that you, you had that. And it's obviously been a big part of your life forever. And Mm -hmm. to be able to have that feeling as you're going through and after treatment is, is really it's, it's inspirational to others who, who may not have that faith, but many people, when they go through a trauma like this, they find it. And it really it's, and it it reminds you that the poem of the footsteps in the sand and, you know, there was two and then there was one. And it's like, well, you left me at this time. And I was like, I didn't leave you. I was carrying you. I love that story. It's beautiful. And I feel that way. I feel like I I had, I did this show one time and and I was just now coming out of treatment. My hair was just now coming in. I'd already been contracted to do it. So I couldn't not follow Mm -hmm. through and I reluctantly did it. I didn't feel like I did a good job. Well, after the show, this chaplain came over to me whom I'd never met before. And he said, I have a a message to give to you from God. He said, and I was like, (laughs) you know, he said that you had to go through cancer in order to be the full person that you're going to be, basically, you're going to help people with this. You're going to have an audience that you cannot see the ends of. And I was like, okay, that's weird. I thank you. You know, it was a little odd for me, but in hindsight, it was a beautiful premonition or beautiful story for me to be able to hang on to. And, and I see glimpses of, of whatever he told me coming to pass. And so anytime that I, I hear somebody say, you know, God told me to tell you this, I pay very close attention. <laughs> so it, it's definitely part of, of what makes me happy. I love that. So Kelly, gosh, we are out of time. I, we could talk all day, but I know you have things to do. Tell our listeners where they can find out all things, Kelly. Well, if you can please go to kellylang.net, that tells you all about me, shows paintings that I've done and, and little things about what my tour schedule is and all. Um, you can also go to my Facebook, Instagram, or our Twitter. I'm active on all of those. I love to uh, correspond with people and I love to hear your stories. If you guys can just tell me, you know, your stories and let us connect via, you know, any emails. Or I have an email on my uh, website that you can go to and, and we try to get back to those regularly. Um, if you want to get my book digitally, paperback or hardback, you can go to either Amazon or kellylang.net to get an autograph copy. Perfect. Kelly, thank you so much for being here today. It has been my pleasure and I know our listeners will really enjoy it. So thank you so much. Oh, awesome. Thanks for having me and blessings to you. You too. And TG as well. So listeners, if you or a loved one need our services, please visit breastfriends.org. You can make a donation on our website or by texting BF radio to 41444 to ensure that women do not go through cancer alone. You can find our show on many platforms on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel or wherever you find your podcasts. So stay with us. No, not stay with us. This is when my brain, this is when I have cancer brain. We'll be back (laughs) next week. And remember, we rise by lifting each other.